All right, so this is the first of two lessons looking at um, a strategy uh, to integrate something uh, we call substitution, which is essentially the chain rule kind of in reverse. Um, and it makes sense that the chain rule is something that once we learn, we use the lot going forwards. And integration is, uh, as a process, is the inverse of differentiation. So it makes sense we need to think about, in essence, what's the inverse of the chain rule? And it's integration by substitution. Um, and so for most of these problems, I have an indefinite integral, and we want to find the, you know, the antiderivative. Um, and so if we just look at this, you know, you kind of want to imagine what we're trying to find here as you have the derivative. We want to figure out what function differentiated to create that. Um, and until now, we've seen examples where pretty much every example we could rather quickly get to one of our basic functions like cosine, and we just know the antiderivative of cosine is sine, or we could use the power rule in reverse. But all of those examples, um, you know, essentially were carefully selected so that you never had to use this integration by substitution, which essentially, if you were differentiating, the chain rule would have never uh, would have never come up, or very very rarely. So with that said, how do we approach this? And we have a couple lessons based on this. And the general idea is you need to kind of build on your knowledge of the chain rule and look at things backwards. And at some point, you make basically an educated guess about what the inside function was and kind of work from there. And like so many things, it may seem a bit strange at first, but it definitely gets easier with some time and some practice. So again, I want to find the antiderivative of this. I want to integrate this. The first thing I need to realize, think about is, OK, so this is, in essence, the derivative of whatever we're trying to figure out. And I can tell there's a composition of functions going on here. So almost certainly, what we're trying to figure out has a composition of functions. And so we need to think about what was the inside function of the function that led to this being the derivative. Or another way of thinking about it, what is the inside function of the antiderivative we're eventually trying to figure out? And this is where we make an educated guess. I say educated because you've been, we've been differentiating and using the chain rule for quite a while now. So we should have a sort of gut instinct. Um, but in essence, if you look at this, if you keep in mind when you do use a chain rule, you can always see elements of the original function in your derivative. Um, and so by that I mean, before I get to this, let's say I have the function the sine of, I don't know, x squared. I want to differentiate that the derivative of the sine of x squared, once we realize the inside function is x squared, so first we differentiate the outside function, which is cosine, leaving the inside function alone. Then we multiply by the derivative of the inside function, which in this case is 2x. That's it. If you look at this, that x squared that I've highlighted, you can see in your derivative. You know, that was the inside function of what I started with. So we're uh, essentially, for these questions, starting here and working our way backwards. But you can almost always see whatever the inside function was from looking at what you're starting with. So in this case, the inside function, I'm going to assume, is the ln of x. OK, that said, our assumptions aren't always correct. But at this point, I, we can also figure out you know, fairly quickly if our assumption is correct. I'm going to say let u equal the inside function, the ln of x. Why u? Why not? Uh, this is kind of a, you know, it's a standard convention. But I'll be boring, and I'll be conventional, and I'll always use u to represent you know, a function that you know, is the inside function of, when we, of our answer, I guess. So if that's correct, then you know, the derivative of u, so du dx, should be the derivative of the ln of x, which is 1 over x. Um, and as well, the idea here is I'm going to want to substitute this u eventually back into my integral here to make it look simpler. Um, but if I'm going to be dealing with u in my integral, I don't want to have dx anymore right here. I want to have du. I need everything in terms of u, which I can do quite nicely because there's a dx right here. And so if I just multiply both sides by dx in this derivative here, I get du equals dx over x. Right, essentially right here, I just multiply both sides by dx. And so now notice, if you look at what I have here, this dx over x, wrong color, this dx over x, I can see in my original function, dx over x. 
which means everything you see highlighted in blue here, I can substitute with du in a moment. And that ln x, again, I chose to make u. And so I still can't yet tell if this is going to work, but it's very encouraging that I can see this dx over x in my function here. So what I'm going to do now is substitute everything in terms of u instead of x. And so if I do that, this becomes the integral of the sine of not the ln of u, the sine of u, or sorry, I should have said not the, si not the sine of ln x, the sine of just u, times that whole dx divided by du is the same as, well, I keep saying the wrong variables, this whole dx over x is equivalent to just du. And what I've done is I've taken a fairly messy integral, and through substitution, I've written it in, in a form that is a very simple integral now. And if I just think in terms of u, I can now integrate this very, very easily. The antiderivative of sine u du, I can see is just minus cos u plus some constant. I can just see that from what we learned before. That said, I'm not done yet, because remember, I wasn't integrating, wasn't being asked to integrate this. I was being asked to integrate this. So all I have left to do now is, okay, let's go back to this u in my answer and put it back into ln x. And then we're done. And if you're not sure, fair enough. I'll always say it's good to be unsure. And we can check now, especially with while we're new at this, and we'll probably be unsure a fair amount, but we've been differentiating lots, I should be able to check quite quickly. If I just look at this, let's differentiate this. And so if I differentiate minus cos ln x, first I differentiate the outside function, the derivative of minus cos is minus minus sine or positive sine, leaving the inside function alone, times the derivative of the inside function. The derivative of ln x is one over x. And what I have there is definitely equivalent to what I started with. And so I can feel very, very, very confident that I'm correct. So like I said now, before I go on to the next problem, if I kind of look at my work here. The basic idea was realizing uh, since you know, I had to think about the chain rule in reverse, and so I had to think about what was the inside function. Um, now, if my guess was not correct, if ln x was not the inside function, what I would notice is I would not be able to get to a step like this. I would not be able to get to a step where I have a fairly simple integral that I can just kind of see by inspection. And so in general, if you, you know, if you don't find yourself able to get to this, if you substitute something but doesn't actually simplify down, then you're probably misunderstanding what was the inside function. All right, so I have a few examples here. And again, there's two lessons on substitution, sorry, on integration by substitution. So definitely, we don't need to be impatient about trying to find it really straightforward really quickly. Okay, let's, let's look at this one. All right, so again, I need to think about what was the inside function. This, essentially, what I'm highlighting in green, this is the derivative of what we're trying to figure out. So what was that thing we're trying to figure out? Well, fairly straightforward guess is to assume that that there, x squared plus 1, was my inside function. So let's start with that. Let u equal x squared plus 1. As soon as I do that, let's differentiate it. So du dx equals just 2x. But again, at some point, like before, I'm going to want to replace dx with something in terms of du. So right here, I want to solve for du. Again, just multiply both sides by dx. I quickly get to du equals 2x times dx. Now, before I go on, let's compare that to what I see. 2 dx d, 2x dx, I can almost see right up in my original integral, except there's no 2 here. No, there's no 2 right there. Well, that's it. Now there is. I just put a 2 there, which is only cheating if I don't do anything to balance it out. But now, by putting a 2 in my numerator, I have this and this matching up perfectly. And again, I can put a 2 in the numerator if I just balance it out by putting 2 in the denominator. Or, what I like better, is putting 1 half in front of the integral. It's all the same thing in the end. It's a constant. And now, I haven't actually changed the overall meaning of this expression here. And so now, that 2x dx, I can just substitute with du. And that x squared plus 1, I can substitute with u. And so let's do that, and you'll see what happens is fairly pleasant. All this equals 1 half times the integral of just du over the square root of u. 
and I can definitely now integrate this, especially if I rewrite it slightly. And so what I want to do, focusing on this now, maybe cleaning up that integral symbol a bit, there we go, is I want to write this, just because I like it better, as u to the power of negative 1 half times du. Right, it's all equivalent. Uh, and now I can definitely just use my power rule. And so the antiderivative of this will still have that 1 half in the front. And then I'll have use my power rule backwards to get u to the positive 1 half when I add 1 to it. And then I divide by a half. But dividing by a half is the same as multiplying by 2 plus some constant. With that said, um, I will say this plus constant, I can put it inside the brackets. It doesn't really matter where it goes. I can also put it over here. Again, it's just any number. It's all kind of the same idea. Um, notice though, my 1 half and my 2 cancel out. So this equals even something nicer, just u to the 1 half plus some constant. Which, at this point, I might as well substitute or put the u back as just x squared plus 1. Because remember, that's what I did at the top. I said let u equal x squared plus 1. And so I can see my answer. So this equals the square root of x squared plus 1 plus some constant. And so notice, in setting up my, my integration by substitution, I'm going to zoom out here so I can see everything. At this point right here, you know, it was important for me to notice there was a 2 there that wasn't in my original function, but it also it's important to realize that I could deal with that very, very nicely. Yeah, it just led to a constant uh, in the front of, my in front of my integral, but constants are great. Constants are easy to deal with. Okay, so I think for this lesson, yeah, I just have one more to look at. And so yeah, everything's a variable, but really in terms of these variables, I'm, uh, oh, I'm, I'm integrating with respect to x because of that dx right there. So a and b are essentially constants in my mind. That's it. Um, you know, a and b can be any number as long as a just can't be 0. And when we see the answer, you'll see why a can't be 0. But really, a and b are just some constants. x is what we're integrating with respect to. So first, let's determine what we think the inside function is. Let's go with ax plus b. So let u equal ax plus b which means du will equal, well, du over dx will include just a. Multiply both sides by dx. So I want to kind of speed this up a bit. I get a times dx. And again, if I look at what I was given, I have a dx right there. Here I have an a times dx. I can take care of that again. a is a constant, remember. So I can put an a there as long as I put 1 over a over here. And that's really important because a is a constant. If, you know, I can't, I can't just put an x right here and then put 1 over x here because those aren't, x is not a constant. I am integrating with respect to x. But a is again a constant. And I know a is a constant because again, it's dx right there. I'm integrating with respect to x. And so now everything you see highlighted in blue in my integral matches up with du. And so now I can rewrite this all as 1 over a times the integral of just du over u. Or, what I actually like, well, I'll leave it like that. I'll do it in a couple steps. I'm not in a rush. I'm going to rewrite this as 1 over a, the integral of u to the negative 1 times, actually, no, I'm going to leave it as 1 over u times du. doesn't really matter. These last two things I wrote down are exactly the same. But what is the antiderivative of 1 over u? What is the antiderivative of u to the negative 1? The ln of u. Or really, the, uh, the ln of the absolute value of u. So this equals 1 over a times the ln of u plus some constant. And remember again, we saw in the first lesson of Unit 5, the, you know, the antiderivative of 1 over x. The antiderivative of 1 over x is the ln of the absolute value of x plus some constant. With that said, all I got left is substitute ax plus b back inside my absolute value. And so my overall answer is 1 over a times the natural logarithm 
of the absolute value of ax plus b, all plus some constant. And these are the sort of answers that scare people when they look at calculus textbooks, because yeah, <laughs> aside from the number 1 in 1 over a, everything's a variable or a function. And you can also see now why the original question had that little constraint where a cannot equal 0, because if a equaled 0, um, we have a problem right here with that constant of 1 over a. But as long as a is not 0, this is all good. And that's where we're done for this lesson. Um, so I'll stop there.